Good morning and welcome to Trinity Episcopal Church here on this Sunday morning, July 19th. A little warm where we are. And although we are separate in body, we are united in spirit. I invite you to join us in singing our opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, and blessed be kingdom, God's kingdom, now, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. 
The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad in the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We will say Psalm 139 responsively by verse. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my raising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it altogether. Press upon me behind and before, Lord, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven and you are there, if I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me will burn Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. Look well, whether there be any wickedness in one in me, and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A reading from a letter of Paul to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, 
and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of this householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, to gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, you, to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Darkness is not dark to you, the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to start today off with a, a riddle for you. What did the Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. No. But I'm fine. I know. There's a purpose to it. Because I'd ask, like to ask you seriously, what do you think a Buddhist mean means when she speaks of becoming one with everything? There's a concept in Eastern thought which is referred to as non-dual consciousness or non-duality. It's found in many Eastern religions, most notably Buddhism. And today is part two of my three-part commentary on the parables of Jesus, as found in chapter 13 in the Gospel of Matthew. And as part of this, we'll touch a bit on how one defines non-duality, and why it might be good to understand it, and how this may help us understand what Jesus is saying. So quick recap, last week, we considered that Jesus' main wish, mission was to proclaim the reign of God, God's reality, which begins in this life, if we're open to it, and continues on into the next. But the reign of God is, because it's so difficult to describe using words, because words by their nature limit the reality of God, Jesus uses parables to help us understand this reign of God. So we look at how Jesus' parables aren't, and then last week we also looked at how Jesus' parables are not, in fact, easy stories 
the straightforward morals at the end, although we often try to shoehorn them into that framework. But in reality, parables are quite complex. They almost all have strange components within them and twists at the end, which cause us to sit up and pay attention. Parables function more like Buddhist koans do than they do morality stories. They are meant not, they're not meant to be obvious, rather they're more like riddles or word games, meant to shock us out of our complacency and see old things in new ways. So that was sort of a little quick recap of last week. And so this week, um, one reason many theologians today believe that Jesus's parables functioned in this way, this sort of uh, uh, having some complexity to them, is because Christianity is both geographically and in its origin and theologically, it's an Eastern religion. We often don't think of it that way. We think of it as Western because that's how we've encountered it is here in the West, but it was founded in Israel on the continent of Asia. And one of the key components of many Eastern religions is this idea of non-duality. That is that there is a connectedness and a oneness of all things. Christians would say that we are one with God, not just humanity is one with God, but that all the creation is united with God. So there was this unity of thinking in the culture of the East where Christianity was born and, and first came into being and consciousness. Dual thinking entered Christianity as it moved West because it became understood through the duality thinking of the, the lens of the platonic Greek world, of which Rome was a part. And it, of course, it was further encouraged after the Enlightenment. So dual thinking is, is the idea that something has to be either or. I'm sorry, I'm sort of getting into this stuff here, but I'm, I'm going somewhere with it, so bear with me. But if we think that something has to be either or, that it's either good or bad, it's right or it's wrong, it's, it's, it's competitive, comparative. Something is always compared to another. Something has to be either or. It's just dual thinking. And one of those two things is going to be in and one of them's going to be out. This way of thinking immediately sets up opposition. It sets up judgment and conflict. To us in the West, this seems normal, but not all people in the world think this way. Non-dual thinking is more in line with the reign of God. The Christian mystic Richard Rohr describes non-dual thinking as our ability to read reality in a way that is not judgmental in a way that is not exclusionary of the part that we don't understand. When you don't split everything up according to what you like and what you don't like, you leave the moment open. You let it be what it will be in itself and you let it speak to you. Reality is not totally one, but it's not totally two either. Stay with that necessary dilemma and it can make you wise. part I really resonated with me is read reality in a way that is not judgmental, in a way that is not exclusionary of the part that we don't understand. Because there's truth there too. So one can look, if you want to look for examples of this non-dual thinking, look at statements that Jesus made. Things like, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Classic non-dual. And for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Non-dual. 
my opening prayer was from the 139th Psalm. So this is, we're looking Hebrew Bible. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. That's non-dual. And they sound illogical to our ears. These are statements which defy a mindset which likes to separate the world into good and evil. This is non-dual thinking. This is not to say that we accept evil, but that we look at it and respond to it through the loving lens of God. We all are regardless of the evil we may have done, part of a good and beloved creation. Both are true. It's not an either or, it's a both and. How do we look at the world as a both and? This non-dual thinking continues in the earliest Christian theologies. For instance, the understanding that Jesus Christ is both fully human and fully divine, not 50-50, but 100% of both. God, that blew, we're in seminary, when we were talking about this, we we're like, huh, what are you talking about? But that, it's a paradox. But it's also not either or thinking. Jesus is one with God and one with humanity at the same time. Non-dual thinking. The theology of the Trinity is also non-dual. God is both three and one. We start applying modern post-enlightenment dualistic thinking to this, it doesn't make sense, it's not logical. The theology of the Trinity only makes sense with a non-dual perspective, which is beyond logic. Richard Rohr also wrote, the world almost always the Western world almost always presents itself as a paradox, a contradiction, or a problem. Like the themes of Christian and non-Christian, male and female. At the mature level, however, we learn to see all things in terms of unitive consciousness, while still respecting, protecting, and working with very real differences. This is the great, perhaps the greatest art form. It is the supreme task of all religion. End quote. There's a greater and greater sense among theologians and Christians that we cannot fully understand Jesus and the scriptures until we begin to wrap our mind around non-dualism, which is uncomfortable for us in the West at first. But it is at the heart, I believe, of understanding and becoming, engaging with the reign of God. So now getting to today's parable, it is like last week about farming. A landowner planted wheat, but an enemy planted weeds alongside the wheat. The servants wanted to remove the weeds, but the landowner says, no, too much of the good wheat will be lost in the process. Just let it be, let it go till the harvest time and the reapers will separate it at that time. So again, remember parables are quirky and they don't always, they're not little morality plays in the same way that we like to think they are. So the, the listeners, the disciples and Jesus' followers who were listening to this parable at the time were probably a little confused. One of the reasons is that, uh, is that the problem itself is odd. That an enemy went out into your field and planted weeds using finding seeds somewhere that may have cost money and spending money and, and taking time to sow weeds in your field in the middle of the night undetected that was unheard of that didn't make sense also it, it identifies the weed as something called darnell it's a common plant it's a normal plant that's grown in this area if you find it everywhere it would just finding Darnell in your wheat field is something that all farmers find. It inevitably grows there. It's not a weird thing. Why would you identify an enemy as having done it? 
And finally, the common practice at the time was that the weeds would be full, pulled if they were discovered in a field, not left mixed in to grow alongside it. The landowner's plan to leave the weeds to grow alongside the wheat would have been strange. Any follower of Jesus listening to this would, parable would have asked, huh? This makes no sense. But what if we apply an understanding of non-dualism to the parable? So that now we have a field with both wheat and weeds. Jesus says they represent the children of God versus the children of the evil one. This sounds a lot like dualistic thinking. But his response about what to do about this duality of people is very non-dual. He doesn't say get rid of the bad ones, get rid of the weeds. For in doing so, some of the good people, the wheat, might be harmed. In fact, we know that the weed darnel looks very similar to the weeds, which is sort of interesting. So you can't even really tell apart the weeds from the wheat. So is Jesus saying perhaps that it is hard to tell who exactly is good and who is bad? Or perhaps we are all a little mixture of both? Or perhaps we need the bad in order for the good to thrive? Maybe the bad is not so bad after all. It's worth leaving them growing, growing there. He seems instead to be saying that while we like the idea of judging, we all like the idea of judging and pulling out the weeds, it's identifying who's bad. Think of the church lady, old Saturday night church lady, being all dualistic. It's not our job to start categorizing people in this life. We are not capable of sorting out the good from the bad, even if there is such a thing. The rain falls on both the good and the evil, and we should let it be. Once we start judging and getting all dualistic, good people will be hurt. We need to recognize ourselves as one crop, respond in love and justice to others, and leave the rest up to God. So when considering dual and non-dual consciousness, we might ask ourselves, in what way do our lives, do we live our lives dualistically? I know I certainly do. I'm very quick to get onto Facebook and start loving and liking and angry little, little uh, memes on there. How do we judge others, others? What sorts of people do we like to judge? Can we recognize the oneness that we all share with our divine creator? Can we love our enemies? Again, this is not to say that we deny the differences between us, but rather to not immediately judge them or make them other, but somehow work with them, be open to what they may have to teach us. without the judgment and anger that comes from comparing and finding others lacking or wrong or bad, how might a non-dual worldview bring us peace? Amen. I invite you to join us as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate to the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people amended from the National Cathedral. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In this challenging and uncertain time of global pandemic and social unrest, we come before you offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church, and the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the church, that it may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and serve as beacon of hope and compassion to a suffering world. We pray for all who minister in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all affected by the coronavirus around the world, for the leaders of the nations that they may work together for the common good as the outbreak spreads, for all affected by the scourge of racism and for those seeking new equitable systems, open eyes and open hearts. May barriers that divide be brought down, that bonds of trust may be strengthened to benefit the entire human family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant public health and government officials in our nation the strength and will to act swiftly and decisively with wisdom and compassion and service to all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. We pray for all those who suffer any grief or trouble, especially Bob, Joan, Sharon, Kay, Jean, Alan, Nancy, Louise, Steve, John, Dan, Ted, Cynthia, Don, Doug, Frank, Patricia, and Samantha. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our essential workers who create and provide our food, our health care, our safety, and our deliveries, keep them safe in their work. Help us appreciate how our collective lives depend on them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless scientists and researchers around the world as they combat the virus, that their work may yield knowledge to develop a vaccine, treatments, and improved measures to reduce its spread. Bless all who strive to create a more just world, and may we all come to see Christ in each other. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Remove the presence of fear and anxiety from our hearts, that confident in your providence we may be generous in sharing our resources. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those on the diocesan cycle of prayer, including St. Paul's Church Linfield, St. Paul's Church Malden, Grace Church Medford, Trinity Parish Melrose, deputies and alternate deputies to the General Convention. We pray also for those enjoying a birthday this week, including Bridget Shad, Ricardo Monzon, Maxine Love, and Courtney Verndakis. 
and we bless and lift up those celebrating an anniversary this week. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there was no pain or grief, but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick. Strengthen those who strive for restorative justice and lift up all who are brought low, that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to unmute yourselves and greet each other with a sign of peace. 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 <laughs> All things come of thee, O Lord. And of thy and of thy own. Own. We have we given thee. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be peace. Alleluia. Let us say together the meditation prayer. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart as though you have already come I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Oh, you're on mute. Carol Dixon. Let us pray together the post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. May God take our hearts and set them on fire. And may the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier be upon you and remain with you and those you love this day and always. Amen. 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 Carol, hopefully you can hear. Okay, you're unmuted. We would... Uh, now I'd like to invite everyone to join us in singing our closing hymn, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Welcome, everyone. You're welcome to unmute.